Chapter 1 Rob Becomes an Outlaw In the days of good King Harry II of England, there were certain forests in the North Country used by the king to hunt. These forests were cared for and guarded by the king's foresters. One of these royal forests was Sherwood, near the town of Nottingham. In this forest lived Hugh Fitzooth, Sherwood's head forester. He lived there with his wife and son Robert. The boy had been born in Loxley town, so he was called Rob of Loxley. He was a handsome and strong boy. As soon as he could walk, he delighted in going into the forest with his father. From his father, he learned to use the longbow. His loving mother, who was from a noble family, taught him to read and write. Rob learned these lessons well, but he was happiest walking in the forest with his bow in hand. Rob's happiness soon ended because his father had enemies. One of these enemies was the Sheriff of Nottingham. One day the Sheriff convinced King Harry that Rob's father had criticized the King in public. Hugh was arrested for treason and sent to jail. Rob and his mother were kicked out of their house. Rob's mother died of shock, and Rob went to live with his uncle, Sir Gamwell. Soon after, Rob got the news that his father had died in prison. Sir Gamwell was a kind man who gladly took care of Rob. Many years later, he said, Rob, there is a chance for you to use that bow for a good purpose. There is an archery contest at a fair in Nottingham. The first prize is a golden arrow. Rob's eyes lit up. I would like a chance to compete, he said. And perhaps I could win a place as a forester, even if I don't win first prize. Now I can see that you are more suited to spend your days walking under the trees, said Sir Gamwell. Good luck to you, lad. The next day Rob set off. It was mid-morning when he came across a group of men. Immediately, he saw the man who had replaced his father as head forester. He was a good friend of the Sheriff of Nottingham. Rob decided not to say anything and kept walking. But the head forester, who did not recognize Rob, spoke up. Where are you going, boy, with your cheap bow and toy arrows? Do you think you have a chance at the fair? <laughs> Rob felt a sudden rage. My bow is as good as yours, he said to the head forester. The head forester replied, Then show us some of your skill, boy. I'll bet you twenty silver coins that you cannot hit the mark I choose. Name your mark, said Rob. I accept your challenge. The head forester pointed to a group of deer far away. Quicker than a flash, Rob took the bow from his back and let an arrow fly. It pierced the heart of the leading deer. Then the head forester grew angry and yelled. Foolish boy, do you know you have killed one of the king's deer? The penalty is death! Get out of here and do not show me your face again! Rob replied angrily. Fine, for I have seen your face too often. You are the one who wrongly took my father's job. With that, Rob turned and walked away. The head forester suddenly realized who Rob was and knew he was an enemy. He picked up his bow and shot an arrow at Rob's back. <coughs> Rob heard the twang of the bow and escaped from it. Quickly, Rob sent an arrow back. The head forester fell forward, dead as he hit the ground. In that second, Rob disappeared into the forest. For several hours, Rob ran, until, tired and hungry, he came to a small house. When he was younger, he had visited the kind widow who lived in this house. So this time he boldly opened the door and entered. 
The old widow was happy to see him and gave him some bread. Rob told her his story, and she sighed. An evil wind is blowing through Sherwood, she said. The poor have nothing because the rich take everything. My three sons killed the king's deer to keep us from starving. They are outlaws, and now they hide in the forest. They tell me that forty men, all skilled archers, are hiding with them. Where are they? cried Rob. I would like to join them. My boys will visit me tonight, said the old woman. Stay here and meet them if you want. When Rob met the three sons, he was eager to join their band. They were men like him who loved the forest and were skilled with a bow. They accepted him and told him that their band was looking for a leader. We are looking for someone who can use his head as well as his bow," said one. "All of us are wanted by the sheriff, so if one of us wins the archery contest in Nottingham, he will be our leader." What a coincidence," said Rob, standing suddenly. "I was on my way there before all this trouble started. I will disguise myself and win the prize." He spoke with such confidence and passion that the three sons were impressed. They wished him luck and told him they would serve him gladly if he was the winner. He must bring the golden arrow as proof. Chapter Two: Rob becomes Robin Hood. The next day, a beggar entered the town of Nottingham. He wore an old cotton hood around his face. He walked with a limp and took his place among the archery contestants. Many looked at him with disgust, but the contest was open to all men. Around town, there were many posters describing Robert Fitzooth of Locksley. Indeed, a reward of two hundred pounds was offered for his capture. However, in the excitement of the fair, many people paid little attention. The sheriff and his men were the only ones looking carefully for Rob. The beggar looked down the row of boxes, and his heart leaped for joy. There sat Maid Marian, Rob's childhood friend. The beggar was really Rob, and he wanted to impress Marian. The contest was announced, and twenty-six archers gathered to shoot at a target fifty meters away. Only twelve archers passed the first round. Rob and another poorly dressed man were among the best shooters. Rob looked at this other man closely. He was a muscular man with a patch over one eye. Rob could see kindness in his eye. Just then, the horn blew to begin the last round. The archers took their places. Each took his turn with some hesitation because the target was far away. None of them put an arrow into the inner circle. Then it was Rob's turn. He also hesitated. His eyes moved to Maid Marian's booth. She met his look and smiled. At that moment, Rob knew she recognized him despite his disguise. He knew he would win the prize for her and gain back some of his family's honor. With new confidence, he drew back his bow and launched his arrow straight and true into the center of the target. The last archer. The man with the eye patch smiled and stepped up to the mark. With no hesitation, he drew his bow and shot his arrow. Straight and true, it flew, but a small wind came up just then. The wind caused it to land just outside the center, right next to Rob's arrow. The man looked surprised when he saw the result. However, 
He was the first to congratulate Rob as the winner. Soon Rob was surrounded by the townspeople who cheered him. They led him to the sheriff's box where the sheriff greeted him. Without a word of thanks, Rob took the golden arrow and turned his back on the sheriff. He walked slowly over to Maid Marian. Lady, he said, please accept this prize. Thank you, Robin the Hood, said Marian. Her smile told Rob that she did indeed recognize him as her childhood friend. <laughs> Later that evening, deep in Sherwood Forest, forty men were sitting around a fire. They were all dressed in dark green clothes, with green cloaks and hoods. They were enjoying a meal of roast deer. Suddenly, they heard a noise from someone approaching. In a second, they all rose with swords and bows at the ready. I am looking for the widow's sons, said a man as he stepped into the light of the fire. I come alone. It's Rob, cried the widow's three sons. Welcome to Sherwood Forest. Did you win the contest? Yes, I did, said Rob. But I cannot prove it. I gave the golden arrow to a fair lady. However, I will gladly join your band of merry men as a common archer. Then a muscular man stepped forward. He was the man with the patch, but now his eye patch was gone. This young man does not lie, the man said to the others. He beat me at the fair, and he won the golden arrow. Then he said to Rob, "My name is Will Stutely. You are a better archer than any man here. I declare that you should be our leader. I will serve no other man but you." The other men gladly swore to follow Rob. They gave him clothes of green like their own. They also gave him a horn and told him that if he needed help, he should blow it three times. Any of them who heard it would come as quickly as they could. Will said, "You shall be known as Robin Hood, for that is what the fair lady called you." Robin Hood smiled and accepted his new name. Finally, he was happy again in Sherwood Forest. Chapter three. Robin Hood meets Little John. Robin Hood and his group of merry men spent the summer hunting in Sherwood Forest. They robbed rich travelers and gave the money to the poor. Their fame grew, and other men joined the group until they numbered almost ninety. The sheriff of Nottingham tried to catch them. But he could not find their camp, nor could he trap them. One day, Robin decided to travel to Nottingham to look around. He picked up his bow and told his men, "Wait here within earshot of my bugle call." Robin knew a shortcut through the woods that led to a small stream. There was a large log that lay over it. Robin jumped up on the log and started to cross. At the same time, a tall, wide man came out of the trees on the other side. Robin was used to giving orders, so he quickly said, "Make way, stranger! I will cross first." The other man was easily taller than Robin by a full head. "No," he said, "I will only give way to a better man than myself." The stranger was armed only with a thick, long oak staff. Robin got very angry. He jumped off the log and cut a branch off an oak tree. As soon as he jumped back up on the log, Robin and the stranger swung their staffs at each other. For a solid half an hour, they fought. Neither one wanted to be the first to say enough. Finally, the big man landed a lucky shot. At that moment. Robin saw more stars than there were in the night sky. He fell dazed and limp into the stream. The stranger laughed and offered the end of his staff to Robin. "Here, pull yourself out with this," he said. 
Robin grabbed the staff and the stranger pulled him over to the bank of the stream. He rubbed his sore head and then blew three long, loud notes. Then twenty of Robin's merry men came out from the trees. Will Stutely said, Well now, what is this? Robin, you are soaking wet. This big fellow on the log put me in the stream with his staff, Robin replied. But our fight was a fair one, and I accept the defeat. You fight better than any man I have come against, said the stranger. I would like to know your name. Well, said Robin, my men and even the sheriff of Nottingham call me Robin Hood. If that's so, then I am sorry I beat you, said the stranger. My name is John Little, and I came to Sherwood to join your merry men. I would be glad to have your staff fighting for me instead of against me, replied Robin. The men laughed at this, and Will had an idea. He loved a good joke, so he said, You must take a new name to join us. I suggest we call you Little John. Then the men laughed louder, and so did Little John. He was pleased to join the merry men. He proved himself to be such a strong and loyal fighter that he became Robin's second in command. One day, Little John did not return to camp. Robin Hood became uneasy. He thought that the sheriff's men might have caught him. I must go to Nottingham, my men, he said. Perhaps the sheriff can tell me what happened to Little John. Robin Hood went through the woods. Before stepping out of the trees, he saw a butcher's wagon coming from within Sherwood and going toward Nottingham. Good morning, friend, called out Robin Hood. I offer you a trade. How about if I give you ten gold pieces for your horse, cart, and all your meat? Today, I want to be a butcher and sell meat in Nottingham. That would be a fair price, said the butcher. In fact, ten gold pieces is too much. Then give me your clothes, too, said Robin. In the market, Robin acted very foolishly. He called out, Get your meat here! Steaks for ten pennies! A kiss is as good as a penny! Many people crowded around Robin's wagon. Other butchers became suspicious of Robin, but they decided to invite Robin to join their guild. We are invited to the sheriff's house this evening, said the leader. Come with us if you would join our guild. Robin gladly accepted, and that evening he went with the rest of the butchers to the sheriff's house. When they arrived, a couple of butchers whispered to the sheriff. This new butcher sold all his meat too cheaply, they said. Maybe he inherited a lot of money from his father and doesn't know what to do with it. The sheriff wondered if he could somehow make money from the foolish butcher, so he invited Robin to sit next to him. Robin was in a lively mood. He said to the sheriff, I have five hundred horned animals, but I cannot find someone to buy them. The sheriff thought Robin meant cows when he said horned animals. He thought to himself that maybe he could buy this foolish butcher's cows for a very small price. Perhaps I might be interested in buying a few cows from you, said the sheriff. You could come by tomorrow and have a look at them, said Robin. I cannot bring them to town because they are scattered here and there, but they are only a half day's ride through the southern part of Sherwood. I would be most happy to come and look at your animals, said the sheriff greedily. At that moment, Robin looked up and saw Little John coming into the room. He was wearing the uniform of one of the sheriff's men. For a second, Robin wondered if Little John was a traitor. Then he remembered that Little John was the most loyal man he had ever met. Little John also saw Robin. He did not speak but moved closer to Robin's chair. When the others were singing loudly, he leaned over and said, Meet me in the kitchen at midnight. 
Robin nodded but did not speak. He pretended to sing along with the others. Soon the party ended, with many drunken butchers and the sheriff's men passed out in chairs and on the floor. The house was quiet, and no one saw Robin going to the kitchen at midnight. Before we continue this story, let's now learn how Little John became one of the sheriff's men. Chapter 4 the Sheriff is Robin's Guest. When Little John went missing, he was actually in Nottingham disguised as a beggar. He had heard there was a fair in town and wanted to look around. What caught his attention most was the contest for staff fighting. On a stage stood a man the people called Eric of Lincoln. He was thought to be the best staff fighter in the area. Little John decided to challenge him. Little John borrowed a staff from one of the men in the crowd. Now the crowd saw the best staff fight they had seen in many years. Crack! Crack! Whish! With an upward strike, Little John knocked Eric's staff up in the air. Then he knocked Eric on the head with a good blow. Little John's third blow was a sweeping one. It knocked the dazed Eric off the stage. Little John climbed down from the stage. Many people crowded around him, patting him on the back. The sheriff came up to Little John and said, I saw you beat Eric of Lincoln. That I did, said Little John. I need someone who can fight like you. Will you work for me? I will give you three new suits of clothes, food, and a room, said the sheriff. Three suits, said Little John. Then I will gladly enter your service. My name is Reynold Greenleaf. Little John went with the sheriff to his house and took his clothes and ate a large meal. He told himself, I will be the worst servant this sheriff has ever had. Two days passed. Little John did nothing but sleep most of the day and eat huge meals. The sheriff's cook became very angry with Little John. On the day of the butcher's party, Little John, as usual, slept late. Halfway through the dinner, Little John woke up and felt hungry. He entered the kitchen, and the cook yelled at him to take some wine to the party. He took the wine and entered the banquet hall where he saw Robin Hood. After the feast was over, Little John went back to the kitchen and then helped himself to a generous portion of meat, wine and cheese. He had just sat down when the cook came into the kitchen. The two men watched each other carefully for a minute. Then they began fighting. To Little John's surprise, the cook was very good with a sword. For a full hour they fought. They made a mess in the kitchen. Finally, Little John said, You are the best swordsman I have ever seen. What do you say if we take a little rest? The cook agreed. After drinking some wine, both men grinned at each other. And now, Reynold Greenleaf, said the cook, Let's finish our fight. Right, said Little John. But first tell me, why are we fighting? To see who is better with the sword, said the cook. I must say, I thought I would beat you easily. So did I, replied Little John. Right now, I think my master and I would like to have you join us. You can use your blade better in his service than the sheriff's. And who might your master be, asked the cook. At that moment, one of the butchers entered the kitchen. I am his master said the butcher, and my name is Robin Hood. The cook was amazed. Here was Robin Hood in the sheriff's house. By God, you are a brave fellow, said the cook. I have heard many stories about you, and this proves you are a great outlaw. But who is this tall fellow who serves you? My name is Little John, 
said Reynold Greenleaf. Well then, little John, or Reynold Greenleaf, and you too, Robin Hood. I like you both. I would enter your service gladly, said the cook. Welcome to the merry men, said Robin. Now I must go back to my bed before my disguise is ruined. I will see you both in Sherwood tomorrow. When Robin left, Little John said, "We should leave the sheriff's house tonight. Let's take some food, wine, and the sheriff's silverware." That's a good plan," said the cook. They filled up two large sacks. Then they went out of Nottingham and into Sherwood Forest. The next morning, the sheriff spoke to Robin over breakfast. I am eager to see your cows. Right," said Robin. "Let's be on our way." Robin and the sheriff left Nottingham. Robin was driving his butcher's wagon, and the sheriff was riding a horse. Eight of the sheriff's men were riding behind them. After riding for a couple of hours, they came to a wide meadow in the woods. On this meadow were five hundred of the king's deer. Robin pulled his cart to a stop. <laughs> This is my herd," said Robin. "Are they not fat and beautiful?" The sheriff was confused. Now, fellow," he said, "you had better explain yourself." In answer, Robin pulled his horn out from under his cloak. He blew three sharp blasts. In a second, forty merry men stepped from the trees. One of the merry men came running up and grabbed the bridle of the sheriff's horse. "Hello, my former master," said Little John. "Reynold Greenleaf," said the sheriff. "What are you doing here?" I've come to invite you to dinner tonight," said Little John. "My master Robin Hood would like you to join him." Little John looked at the butcher and smiled. "It's true," said Robin. "I am Robin Hood. You thought you would trick a foolish butcher out of his cows. Now you are the one who has been tricked. Tell your men to go back to their homes, or they will be shot full of arrows before they can draw their swords." The sheriff told his men to leave. As soon as they were gone, the merry men led the sheriff into the forest. Finally, they came into a large clearing under a huge tree. A large fire was burning, and over it were several pieces of juicy meat from the king's deer. The merry men treated the sheriff politely, as if he were an important guest. "Sit here on my cloak," said one to the sheriff. We have prepared games and contests for your amusement. Never in all his life did the sheriff see such fine displays of archery, sword fighting, or staff fighting. After the contests, the merry men sang songs and told jokes while they ate dinner. It would have been a great experience for the sheriff, except for three things. First, he was a prisoner of his enemy. Second, he recognized his valued cook as he prepared dinner. Third and finally, he was sad to see that his meal was handed to him on his own silver plate. Sadly, the sheriff said to Robin, "No doubt you plan to kill me. Why do you torture me like this?" "Fear not, sheriff," said Robin. "We will let you live." But you must promise not to harm any outlaw in Sherwood Forest. The sheriff thought for a moment and then said, "Okay, I promise that I will not disturb or seek to arrest the outlaws in Sherwood." Robin and his men raised their wine glasses and said, "Cheers!" Then Robin took the sheriff back along the winding path to the road that led to Nottingham. At the edge of the forest, he said, "Farewell, sheriff." I hope that you have enjoyed this evening's feast. The next time you hire a servant, make sure he is not hiring you. And the next time you plan to cheat a foolish rich butcher, make sure he is not cheating you. Then Robin Hood hit the back of the sheriff's horse. The animal galloped away, carrying a very embarrassed sheriff.
Chapter Five. Robin Hood marries Marian. One day in autumn, Little John and two merry men were watching the road that ran through Sherwood. They were hoping for a rich knight or fat priest to come by so that they could rob him. Soon they saw a knight riding very slowly down the road. Little John and Will noticed that the knight seemed to be very sad. Little John walked toward the knight. When he got close, he respectfully said, "My master expects you to dine with him today. Good night." In a sad voice, the knight said, "Who is your master?" "It is Robin Hood," said Little John as he took hold of the horse's bridle. Seeing this, the knight shrugged carelessly. "It does not matter," he said. "Lead me to your master." When they arrived at their camp, Robin Hood jumped up. "Welcome, Sir Knight," he said. "We were just about to sit down for supper. Please join us." The knight slowly got off his horse. He took off his armor and helmet. As he did so, Robin suddenly recognized him. Sir Richard of Lay, is that you? Asked Robin. He recognized the father of his childhood friend, Maid Marian. Yes, that is my name," said the knight. "How do you know me, sir? I am Rob of Locksley," said Robin. "As a boy, my cousin and I played with your daughter Marian." "Oh yes," replied the knight. "You have grown." I would have never recognized you. It seems your fortune has grown, while mine has disappeared. What troubles you, Sir Richard? Said Robin. Please tell us your story over a good meal and wine. Sir Richard told Robin about how he had left England to fight with the king in a war. While he was gone, his only son grew up and became addicted to gambling. Soon he had gambled away most of the family's money. Once he could not pay his debt, another knight killed him. When Sir Richard returned, he had to borrow some money to find his son's killer. Unfortunately, I borrowed from the Bishop of Hereford," said the knight. "He charged high interest, and I could not pay it. I had to borrow against my land and my castle." Now I am on my way to ask the bishop for more time to pay back the loan, but I am afraid he will refuse. He is greedy, and I know he wants my land, even though he already has more than enough of his own. That is true," said Robin. "The bishop is not a man of God; he only serves his own greedy purposes. How much do you owe him?" "Four hundred gold pieces," replied the knight. Well, Sir Richard, this is your lucky day," said Robin. "I will loan you four hundred gold pieces, and I will charge no interest." Sir Richard looked as if Robin had just saved his life. How can you be so generous? It is my business to aid the poor and steal from the rich," said Robin. Little John and my men thought you were a rich knight, so they brought you here. But you need our help instead, and we offer it gladly. The knight looked like a new man. The food, the wine, and now Robin's offer had restored his spirits. Thank you, Robin," he said. "On my honor, I will pay you back within a year. And if you ever come to my castle, I will treat you and your men to a wonderful feast." You may always count on me as a friend. Then Sir Richard left, and he paid the bishop back the loan. He kept his castle and his land. After a year passed, Sir Richard returned to Sherwood Forest to see Robin Hood. With him was his daughter Marian. Sir Richard was true to his word, and he gave Robin Hood back all the gold he had borrowed.
Robin and Marion renewed their friendship. Marion had kept the golden arrow Robin won for her. It was her most valuable possession. They walked and hunted together under the trees of Sherwood. When it came time for Marion and her father to leave, Robin shyly asked Marion to stay in Sherwood as his wife. Oh, Robin, I love you also, said Marion. But my father is getting old and weak. I must take care of him during the cold winter at our castle. You and your father can spend the winters in the castle and the warmer months with me and my merry men in Sherwood, Robin said. Marion agreed. The happy couple asked permission from Sir Richard to wed. At first he was unsure because Robin was an outlaw, but he relented. He could see how much they loved one another. At last, Robin felt as if much of his former life was restored. He had revenge on his enemy, the Sheriff of Nottingham. He was the master of Sherwood. And with Marion as his wife, he could start a new family. He and his merry men had many adventures. They became the most famous and well-liked, at least by the common people, outlaws in England. <laughs>